a lot of these guys to this day still don't know how, how to properly turn pro. You know, there's so much talent over in Eastern Europe. I know what it's like to be a young fighter and have a dream. And if you don't have those doors open for you, you know, it, it, it could get tricky and it could be very frustrating, you know? So for those fighters to have uh, somebody like Igis to open doors for them and, and to have them get this huge notoriety as professionals the way they would deserve, it's not something that's done very easily. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would put your hands together, one of the most powerful managers in boxing, he manages Vasily Lomachenko, Alexander Yusik, and of course, Sergey Kovalev. Please welcome the 2018 Boxing Writers Manager of the Year, Igas Klimas. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Los Angeles. Managers come in all shapes and sizes. They do different things. Some guys call themselves a manager and collect a fee and don't do anything. Uh, and then there are managers like Agus who, you know, live and die with their fighters, who really do get involved in whatever needs to be taken care of, who oversee their training, who take care of whatever the problem is at the moment. Um, Agus is a great manager. He knows what's achievable because he knows both sides of the coin. So he bats his corner for the fighters, but also he understands the market, the model, the broadcasters, the industry. I think that's what fighters like from a manager. They want someone that can navigate their career, but they also want someone that's emotionally invested. When I met Igas, I immediately realized that he was a serious person. It doesn't take rocket science to be a good manager. You have to be diligent, you have to care about your fighters, and Igas is all of that. Igas is about business, but business with a heart. The relationship with him, even he's a manager, like relation for me and him, I consider him as a friend. And I always like appreciate that friendship and like respect from him and from me to him is just, yeah, something, something special. Wow, do you think we have time? That's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> So maybe we can get through this stuff, Ellie. Well, basically, you know, I was born in uh, Lithuania. I wouldn't say I was very poor. I was grew up with a poor family. It wasn't a poor family. Unfortunately, I lost my father in a car accident when I was five years old. My mom got remarried, and we were uh, three kids in the family. I was 21 years old when my mom died. Back in the day in the Soviet Union, not too many people were very healthy. A week later, I joined the uh, Russian army in an uh, engineering department's battalion. It was 1989, summertime. Uh, I ran in one of my colleagues who was already preparing the documents to leave Lithuania and go somewhere aboard. I didn't thought much, I you know, like a week or two, and I made the decision, okay, I'm going. So I started preparing all the documents, all the paperwork. It took me like maybe two, three months, and I got the permission to leave. They took my passport away, so I was a citizen of Nobody's, nowhere, so I had no citizenship. I had only one piece of paper with my picture on it and uh, was like, uh, I believe, three visas. So when I came to Austria, you know, when you're already in that environment, so you know, you're talking to people. So I heard from somebody what there is a IRC, International Rescue Committee. They said, okay, we have an interview at the United States Embassy. After that, I was granted to be a political refugee. That's how I ended up, 1989, end of November, Seattle, no friends, no family, English. Oh, I knew how to say I'm hungry, just in case. I had $42 in my pocket at that time. And I remember us today, on the way from the airport, you come up up to the hill, and then you see the downtown of Seattle. All those lights, when I saw all that downtown, I felt myself about like this bit. 
all those skyscrapers. And I gave to myself a question like, I guess, what you're doing here? What are you doing here? And at that moment, if somebody would say, you can close your eyes and you open back home and count us, I probably would do it. Where he came from originally to get to the place where he is one of the biggest power brokers in this sport, you don't see that all that often. Boxing was my passion. I used to box. I used to have a few, you know, a few amateur fights. And uh, then I came to the States. Of course, I was following. My first bout, I saw a live, 1992, Riddick Bove, Evander Holfield. I, I bought the $800 ticket and I went to, to see a match. I think it was crazy. It was probably like the last money I had on my, on my, on my, <laughs> on my checking book. Beginning of 2000, I went to New York City. It was a heavy night. Only heavyweight was that night on a card. And the next morning, somehow, hotel or cafe, I don't remember, you know, I was sitting at a table, and the next, next table was sitting uh, Don Turner, who was a whole fields trainer at that time. And I kind of like, and he was like, oh, kiddo, what are you looking at? We said, uh, we probably, I, you know, I recognize you, you're a uh, Holfin's trainer. And he says, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he goes like, sit down, you know, let's talk about it. And you know, for me, it was like, wow, you know, something else. And I just sit down with him to have a cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, like, you know, four hours later, all we've been talking about boxing. And then he gave me his phone number. But he goes like, I know you guys have a lot of good fighters back in Russia, Ukraine, Lithuania, and uh, if you ever think about bringing anybody, I have a good training camp in North Carolina, I can train your fighters. That's how my boxing journey started. I think a lot of American fighters simply would not have the mentality to look at Oxnard as being luxurious. And if you take a look at Agus Klimas and his crew at Boxing Lab, they probably look at Oxnard in a certain way. And I, and I think that's a big key, is that having the ability to be disciplined. Boxing Laboratory, I would say it's an international boxing gym. If you even walk into the gym, you will see a bunch of flags. It means somebody from that country was in the gym training or still in the gym training. Sometimes when I think about that, some countries are fighting in between. But these guys, when they come to boxing laboratory, they live like a brothers. These fighters who went to the Olympics together and now are in the professional game and now they're world champions at the same time. I'm talking about cruiserweight Usyk, light heavyweight uh, Vozdik, and Lomachenko in lightweight. 